and uh, hop into it. Both players are at 10 and 2. Bob Kwong is on Gorgo's Vengeance. Brian Huffman, who is on John. Uh, and let's go ahead and see what, what happens. So for any of you who are unfamiliar with these decks, we haven't seen Jund yet. And basically, Jund is kind of the classic mid-range control deck of the format. It's looking to get some card advantage, control the board, and then win with a couple efficient creatures. Bob's deck, on the other hand, is a really, really, really unique deck. Basically, he's looking to use Goryeo's Vengeance or Through the Breach to get a Grizzle Brand in play. And he can do that extremely early. He has some discard outlets. He has some ways to get some uh, extra mana on specific turns. And as soon as he gets uh, Grizzle Brand into play, he'll be able to start drawing cards. And with the Shoals, he can replenish his life total. And eventually, he'll be able to get a Borborgamos Enraged in play and then just kills opponent on one turn. So I believe that this deck is capable of from some extremely early wins. I mean, I think there may even be a Goldfish that's like a turn one or two win, which is pretty broken. Wow. So Brian Huffman here is going to start off on an Inquisition. He's going to take the Goryeo's, Ven Goryeo's Vengeance out of Bob's hand, but it looks like Bob was able to pick up uh, Faith is Looting, and that's going to get things going for him. He could very easily just draw into some pretty busted cards here and win the game very early. Yeah, this Goryeo's Vengeance deck is really, really hard for the Jund deck to play against. Jund is set up as being a very interactive deck. It has discard spells, it has removal spells, but the problem is uh, it's just not set up to interact with the Goryeo's Vengeance deck. The discard against Goryeo's Vengeance can be a little dicey. The targeted cards like Thoughtseize and Inquisition have their use, but one of Jun's best discard uh, sources is Liliana the Veil, and it can be really scary to activate that with its plus ability because you may be enabling Bob to you know, put a Grizzle Brand into play and then Goryeo's Vengeance it out. So it looks like Bob is going to go ahead and get rid of a Borborygmos Enraged and a Desperate Ritual to that Faithless Looting, and then pass the turn back to Brian. He's going to take a draw, and let's see what, what he has going on here. I have to imagine that he needs to put a threat on the battlefield, something like Dark Confidant, maybe even a Tarmogoyf, or even a Scavenging Ooze might be pretty good. Yeah, he definitely wants a Tarmogoyf. The scavenging, if he gets a Scavenging Ooze, the Scavenging Ooze would be a little bit of a slow target. The fact that it can start exiling things from Bob's graveyard is very valuable. Uh, but he really wants to make sure that he doesn't die as much as he can, but he really needs to get some pressure also. So it looks like Brian did have another discard spell uh, with a second copy of Inquisition of Kozilek, and that's going to take the second Goryeo's Vengeance out of Bob's hand, who just has three lands and an Izzet Charm that's left over. So one thing that I'm particularly excited about with this matchup is Bob Huang is an uh, extremely good deck designer. He's, uh, he was the one who originally kind of broke Treasure Cruise when it first came out with the blue-red Delver deck in Legacy. And I know that uh, this Goryeo's Vengeance deck is a deck he's picked up, and he's one of the, the innovators of it and has led to its increased popularity. So this is going to be really exciting to see how he plays it. So it looks like we just get a, uh, a Verdant Catacombs here from Brian Huffman. He's going to fetch on Bob's end step put an overgrown tomb onto the battlefield, and Bob just played a land and passed the turn. I have to imagine he's looking at using an Izzet Charm on Brian's end step to, uh, to draw two cards and dis discard two cards. He did pick up another a copy of uh, Gristlebrand, which is very good, but two of his Goryeo's Vengeance are already gone. Yeah, things are lining up pretty well so far for the Jund deck. The Jund deck has had the right kind of disruption. I mean, the Jund deck normally only plays about six removal spells in its whole, uh, uh, excuse me, six uh, di targeted discard spells in its whole deck. And, and so seeing, far, we're, we're seeing half of those yeah, now. Yeah, Brian's drawn half of them. So that's really, really good for Brian. Despite that, he still needs to, you know, develop some pressure. So, so far, so good for Brian, but uh, he's still missing that one piece of the puzzle for his draw, which is pressure. Yeah, he still needs a threat to actually w end the game. Now, looks like Bob is thinking here in response to the thought sees, maybe using the Izzet Charm to either counter or to draw two cards and discard two cards. But I think he's just going to let that resolve. So Brian is going to take the Izzet Charm, leaving Bob with a Bloodstained Mire, a Mountain, and a Gristlebrand. So Brian Huffman has done a real good job at picking apart Bob's hand, and now here's the payoff, as he does have a Tarmogoyf that's going to come down as a 4-5, and will end the game in five short turns if Bob doesn't do anything. So the one thing that can be a little scary is that Bob's deck is capable of some some pretty powerful sequences. I mean, he's going to be able to flash back his Faithless Looting and get that Grizzlebrand in the graveyard if he wants. And he could just top deck a Goryeo's Vengeance. Or if he just plays, you know, a few more lands, he can just top deck a Through the Breach and also put the Grizzlebrand into play that way. 
So it looks like Bob is just going to flash back his Faithless Looting. He did draw into two additional lands and a land for his draw step. So his hand was just a bunch of lands and a Gristlebrand. He decided to get rid of two of his lands. Uh, Brian's just going to go ahead and attack with his Tarmogoyf for the turn. Looks like he has two lands and a Coligan's Command in his hand. So I have to imagine at some point he's going to try and use that to either get in some damage with Bob or snipe, snipe a card out of his hand and rebuy something if he needs to. And there is that Through the Breach that you were talking about, Andrew. So Bob has Through the Breach, Gristlebrand, and a land in his hand. So he is going to be able to, uh, to try and get something going. Now, it's important here to note that Brian does have only two mana available here. Had he kept three lands available, he could have actually got this... Uh, uh, he, could, he could have potentially tried to use something with his Coligan's Command with taking a card out of, out of Bob Huang's hand here on this turn. But, it's, I mean, you would have to be some kind of clairvoyant to know that this is the, the correct time to use it. Yeah, the other thing, too, is from the previous discard spells, Brian knows that Bob has a lot of lands in hand, and if he casts the Colgan's Command, it's a good chance that Bob would just discard one of those lands and it, it wouldn't actually have that big of an impact. But this is exactly why this Goryeo's Vengeance is so good and why Jund has such a hard time with it. Is uh, The Jund deck basically had the perfect draw of just three discard spells and two Tarmogoyfs, but Bob's, you know, probably just going to win the game from here. Yeah, so he's just going to attack with his Gristlebrand. He's going to put Brian Huffman down to 8. He's going to go up to 17. He's going to go ahead and draw 7 cards here. And at this point, what he's looking for is Nourishing Shoal and World Spine Worm uh, to gain a whole bunch of life so that he can activate this Gristlebrand a bunch more. So it looks like there is a World Spine Worm there. It also looks like there is a Nourishing Shoal. So at this point, he just needs to cobble together a bunch more cards so that he can put a Borborygmos Enraged on the battlefield and just throw some lands at Brian Huffman. Yeah, I mean, the some of the interaction... I mean, this deck uses a lot of cards that are not particularly common. Essentially, what Nourishing Shoal does is he's going to be able to discard this World Spine Worm instead of paying the mana cost for the Nourishing Shoal, and he's just going to be able to gain a ton of life and be able to draw seven with the Grizzle Brand and continue doing this until he's basically seen almost all the cards in his deck. And at that point, he's going to be able to use his uh, Elvish Spirit Guides and uh, Desperate Rituals to try and power out either another Through the Breach or something of that nature to uh, put a Borborygmos onto the battlefield. At this point, he does have a Borborygmos in his graveyard, so all he needs to find is um, a Mana Morphos, a couple Spirit Guides, and one of those last Gorios Vengeance, and he can just kill his opponent. Yeah, I mean, Bob is just a real master of this. He's not going to make any mistakes, and this is basically game, but it, it certainly highlights uh, how difficult this deck can be to fight against. I mean, sometimes this Goryeo's Venge Vengeance deck, it trips over itself, but it, you can have a lot of disruption, but if he just pairs a Goryeo's Vengeance or a Through the Breach at any time with a Grizzlebrand, I mean, it's just off to the races. Yeah, it's pretty crazy uh, just, just how good pay 7, draw 7 really is. Yeah. I mean, we've seen uh, a lot of people try to abuse Grizzlebrand in various ways. I mean, we see it a lot in Legacy, for sure. But even in Modern, people have tried to f develop different kinds of strategies to abuse Goryeo's Vengeance's, uh, excuse me, abuse Grizzlebrand's power of just drawing 7 and losing 7 life. And I think this deck is the one that's done it the best so far. So one of the things you see here is as Bob is going through drawing all these cards, he's kind of organizing them into a couple different piles so that he knows you know, what plans he needs to do f at, at what stages so that uh, he can go ahead and just end the game whenever he needs to end the game. Yeah, I mean, he's literally drawn all the cards in his deck, and now he's just dumping out a few spirit guides to make some red mana. Oh, and we got the F6. <laughs> Seems like we have a moto grinder on the on the table, and yeah, so he's got enough red Here mana out of nowhere to through the breach a Bor Borgamos, and then he can just discard lands to finish Brian off. So it looks like we've got a storm count of about fifteen at this point. <laughs> yeah, and at this point they're just having fun. But this deck is is uh, a deck that's not you don't really see it too much. I mean. There's really not that many people who play this Goryeo's Vengeance deck. It's very difficult to pilot, but it's extremely powerful as we've seen it there. And that combo, you can see it done extremely early. The fact that there's Simeon Spirit Guides and Desperate Rituals means that Bob can actually get a lot of mana really early on, even as early as turn one or two. Yeah. And uh, this is definitely a card that is on a lot of people's radar, probably for this upcoming Pro Tour. 
So let's go ahead and take a look at the sideboards here for Bob and Brian and see what kind of action we're going to have going on. So Bob has three Pact of Negation, one Besaju who shelters all, one Rending Volley, two Pyroclasm, two Sh Sudden Shock, two copies of Painful Truths, two Shatterstorm, and two Inquisition of Kozilek. What do you think Bob's going to bring in here? So this is going to be a tricky deck to evaluate. I don't believe that Bob is going to win a sideboard a whole lot. Uh, I think that you can make an argument for the Pact of Negation if he just wants to protect himself a little bit. If he doesn't think his life total is going to be under duress that quickly and it's going to be more about fighting through the Jun disruption, he may want to bring in a card like Painful Truths. And I think he can make a small argument to Inquisition of Kozilek. But honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if Bob, you know, almost just shuffles up the same deck because it's, it's just naturally so good against Jund. I definitely agree with that. I think that Painful Truce might be something that he wants to bring in as a way to battle all that discard. But then again, we saw there, didn't even need it. Yeah. Three in a row. All right, you're dead on turn five. Yeah. Uh, as far as Brian Huffman's concerned on Jun, we've got one additional Thoughtseize, an Unravel the Aether, a Pyroclasm, an Ancient Grudge, two Kitchen Finks, four copies of Fulminator Mage, a Painful Truce, a Shatterstorm, an Obstinate Bailoth, a Knight of Souls Betrayal, and a Hunt Master of the Fells. Does he really have anything here for this? Well, he's certainly going to bring in the uh, third Thoughtseize, and I think also he'll bring in the Fulminator Mages. The Fulminator Mages are not particularly great, uh, but any kind of interaction that he can have to disrupt his, oppo his opponent is pretty important. Also, Brian just has all of these dead removal spells. Cards like Maelstrom Pulse, cards like Abrupt Decay, Terminate, they really don't do a whole lot. He might be able to sneak in a Terminate uh, in response to the activation of Grizzlebrand and have that be effective. But a lot of the times, I don't think that's going to actually let him win the game. That may just let him play for a turn or two more. So I think Brian is going to be reaching for cards, and uh, he just wants to get those bad removal spells out. I've, when I played Jund, I even brought in cards like Huntmaster of the Fells, just so I have more of a clock, because I have so many dead cards. Yeah, as we saw there, Brian just really needed some type of early pressure to go along with all that discard, and he just wasn't able to, wasn't really able to cobble it together. Uh, so uh, while we wait for our players to finish sideboarding and shuffle up, let's just go ahead and take a quick look at these awesome invitational tokens that you can get simply for playing in our opens or buying orders on StarCityGames.com. So we have Alex Bastecki, who is our Season 3 Invitational winner in New Jersey, who is a 0-0 germ, and I really like this token. Yeah, Alex Bistecki has a bit of a science background, so for his token he wanted to be a bit of a mad scientist. I really like how all the players, they bring in some of their own personality into these tokens. I think it's a lot of fun. Also has a pretty sweet beard. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm jealous. I won't, I won't lie. I mean, I'm not, but... <laughs> uh, and you, so you can receive a limited edition invitational token uh, for all of our open participants, all of our classic participants, and in all orders from StarCityGames.com. Now, we also had an invitational after that where Caleb Shearer won, uh, and he is a storm counter. So Caleb won that invitational with his abs and aggro deck and standard and affinity deck in modern, but he is known as a uh, you know, legacy mad scientist primarily with the Storm deck, so he decided to go with the Storm counter. Yeah, I mean, quite the Storm fanatic and legacy. He's known for playing it, you know, basically forever. Another thing that's particularly exciting about Caleb is, I mean, he was kind of a nobody a year and a half ago. And then he just sort of broke onto the magic scene. He decided that he wanted to do really well on the Star City circuit. He really wanted to get into the Players' Championship. And, you know, he's, he's just really come out of nowhere and kind of been a little bit of like a dark horse story for mm -hmm. a lot of the narratives going on and it's been exciting to see him rise perfect and again that's going to start january 29th uh at 12 p.m eastern standard time for orders on starcitygames.com and you can get those in person starting in atlanta uh for the uh standard open which is the oath of the gatewatch release so we've got brian huffman on john uh, it's 10 and 2. Bob Huang on Glorious Vengeance is also 10 and 2. And it looks like both players uh, are taking mulligans. Yeah. Either way, it's going to be tough for Jund. I wouldn't even say that the mulligans necessarily favor the Jund deck more than the combo deck. Although normally I feel like combo decks really want to have more cards as opposed to a deck like Jund that has so many individually powerful cards on its own. Yeah, I think that even when mulliganing plus it's offset by the scry. Bob, while he does have to cobble together some number of cards to win the game, he has a lot of redundancy and everything is just so powerful that once something gets together, it's just over. Uh-oh, looks like Bob picked up seven cards. 
Yeah, well, while the judges resolve this, I remember the last time that I played a Grand Prix with Jund and I faced this Gorius Vengeance deck. It's mm -hmm. one of the first weekend where this deck kind of had a, a big showing. And it was pretty interesting for me because I remember I played a player in one of the early rounds playing Gorio's Vengeance. And the player was a little new to the deck, didn't know all the interactions. And the deck really didn't seem that well to me. And then later on in the tournament, I was, I don't know, maybe, maybe X3 or X4 on day two. And I played against uh, one of Bob's friends playing the Scorio's Vengeance deck. Mm -hmm. And it was unreal. He was just splicing onto Arcane, all these different cards. <laughs> it, uh, you know, I, I just couldn't pick him apart, no matter how many discard spells that I drew. And then he just Blood Mooned me out in game three, which I didn't see coming. It doesn't seem like Bob has Blood Moon in his deck yet, uh, for this week. But, you know, there's a l playing against a really good player playing this deck, it's like night and day from someone who's inexperienced. So it looks like here, Brian is going to be actually mulliganing down to five. Bob, it looks like, since he didn't actually pick up those cards and look at them and put them in his hand, they just went ahead and put the, uh, the seventh card back on top of his library, and he does have his hand of six, which he is currently keeping. So we're hoping here that Brian can have a playable five, uh, get some nice, nice cards, or a nice card off of his scry, uh, so we can actually get on here and have a match. But it does not looking good for Jund. Um, one mulligan's bad, two... Two mulligans is worse, and he's even playing a bad matchup. Yeah, I would expect the Jun player, even if they have a, a you know, fine seven-card hand, to mulligan it anyway, just because the matchup is so bad. You have so few cards that are actually good in the matchup, and I would have expected Brian to, you know, mulligan fairly aggressively to try to get just some sort of turn one discard spell into a turn two Tarmogoy for Dark Confidant. That's really how he wants to start. So we see Bob here is going to fetch out an island with his polluted delta. And it looks like he's going to cast a Serum Visions, which is a new addition to this deck. Uh, as traditionally, it was just straight black-red. But it looks like that third color has been added for Serum Visions and also gives him a super-powered uh, Painful Truce out of the sideboard. Yeah, we also saw the Is It, uh, is it Charm mm -hmm. last game also, which is kind of a nice way to draw some cards, discard some cards. So it looks like Brian's just going to draw for his turn, not have a second land, and pass the turn back, which is not boding very well for him. Yeah, you know, and it's pretty, ex I mean, this tournament has been pretty exciting because I've, I've definitely heard a lot of people sometimes complain that Modern is kind of a stale format, but we've been seeing things get shaken up quite a lot. I mean, the, the big mana decks like the Amulet Bloom deck uh, have been sort of the the new kid on the block that's really been dominating, but we've also seen the Black Eldrazi decks start mm -hmm. to do really well. Bob and some other people have been slowly tuning the Scorio's Vengeance decks. And I think if sometimes, if the only thing you look at is the top eights, you don't, you know, go down the list to see who's in the top 32, top 64, things can look a little stale. But I feel like, you know, right under the surface, there's quite a few decks that are really close to being, uh, you know, one of the major contenders in the metagame. I definitely agree. I feel like Modern is just a huge format. And we can even see that here from, from this, the, the metagame. Uh, breakdown that we talked about a little bit earlier. There are literally 15 to 20 decks that are in this yeah. day two, and there's only 67 participants. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a pretty big deal. I mean that is a that is a, exactly what you want. That's a nice, healthy meta game where there are, uh, you know, a couple top decks, so you have some sense of what you're going to expect. But then there's just such a larger diversity. It's almost like a you know a pyramid structure. And so that's, that's certainly what I look for in a game. So it looks like after a couple Serum Visions and making his land drops here uh, from Bob, Brian unfortunately has missed his land number two and land number three. Uh, and we're going to his next turn. Looks like it's not a land. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not looking very good for Brian. Bob's on three lands. Looks like he has a bunch of action in his hand. And we're just a few turns away from Bob doing his thing and taking this game. Yeah. I mean, not only is it a bad matchup, but it looks like Brian's, Brian's draw is just not lining up well for him and currently Bob just has all the time in the world. I mean he has no reason to rush. He can just sort of bide his time, sculpt his hand, and he can just kind of combo out at his convenience. So it looks like Brian does have a one mana discard spell that he was able to pick up in Inquisition of Kozilek. So he's going to use his Wooded Foothills, uh, take that over Overgrown Tomb out of his deck, and Inquisition Bob. Now, Bob does have an Izzet Charm in his hand, so he might just counter this to protect something that's in his hand, um, depending on what else he has. But again, a lot of these combo pieces, through the Breach, the creatures, uh, and the like, cost more than three mana. So Inquisition is mainly looking to get some of the enablers, the mana enablers, something like Gorgos Vengeance, or maybe even Nourishing Shoal, depending on what else is in the hand. 
Yeah, that's one of the tricky things about this deck is that a lot of the things that you would want to make them discard are, are just too big. So it looks like here we've got a... Gorios was taken off of the Inquisition, but I have to imagine that Bob's going to use his Izzet Charm here to try and draw into some more lands with the idea of just trying to, through the breach, a World Spine Worm onto the battlefield, which, which can attack for 15 and then put three five fives. Yeah, so if you're unfamiliar with World Spine Worm, essentially when it dies, you get a bunch of tokens, and the tokens are about as big as it is. So that's a good uh, two-turn clock. So it looks like he did fire off that is it charm. He was able to pick up one land and another copy of Nourishing Shoal. I imagine he's probably going to get rid of one of the Nourishing Shoals. Oh, yeah. Or maybe he's going to get rid of the land. Don't need it. Don't need it. I got more on top of my deck. Yeah, they're going to be there. <laughs> Don't worry. Whatever Bob does, I'm just going to assume it's the right decision. I mean, yeah, I'm just going to default. Bob knows best. Yeah, I have, a, I have a lot of faith in Bob. So it looks like he's going to get rid of that land, which is, which is a little interesting to me since, it's, since it seems like his line of play here is just to, through the breach, a world spine worm. I, I do agree with that also. I think he may just assume that he's going to be able to draw more lands. He might have uh, drawn some already off that is a charm. Let's and his deck has a lot of mana in it. I mean, he's got, yeah, you know... Yeah, like the Spirit Guides, Desperate Rituals. And he did right. draw a Spirit Guide. Oh, he's... He can splice for four mana. And these Which is these are the interactions that I was talking about. The first time I played against this deck, yeah. my opponent didn't wow. really know how to splice things properly. And then I played against one of Bob's friends, and it seemed like he had all of this card advantage from this splice mechanic that I had never seen anyone use. So what he did there is Bob discard got rid of the land so he could keep two Nourishing Shoals and a World Spine Worm along with the... Uh, through the breach so that he was able to uh, Nourishing Shoal... Pitching Nourishing Shoal, splicing through the breach onto the Nourishing Shoal for only four mana, which is what he needed the Spirit Guide for, to put the World Spine Worm onto the battlefield, attack for 15, and then make three five fives. Yeah, quite the impressive play. And that really just shows, you know, Bob's making use of card mechanics that we have not seen in an extremely long time, and we've basically... Uh, well, we haven't seen them printed in a long time, and we haven't seen them used in an even longer time. I mean, the whole splice mechanic, I think, is something that some people have kind of forgotten about. Yeah, it's it's not a very, I don't want to say it's not a very intuitive mechanic, but it can be tricky sometimes uh, as far as with how it actually works, like what happens when it gets countered, um, you know, this and that, what happens when there's multiple targets and one of them's not legal. Like, it's there's can be some tricky things with it.